Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Jose Luis Cortez, president of the International Union of Architects. And on the name of the International Union of Architects, I want to congratulate all the members of the public health group. You, know, you have been working very hard uh, during the last one and a half year. And I admire you but because you have really accomplished a very good uh, uh, impact you know, in the whole world because many people are observing you and following you. And as you know, this year, 2022, has been declared the year of design and health. The United the Union of International Architects has been saying that we have to put a lot of attention on the public health. You know? And uh, I want to congratulate all the participants as well. You know, the participants are very important issue because we can do a lot of efforts, but if we don't have somebody to listen to what we say, so it's not, uh, it's not worth. And at the same time, all the speakers, I congratulate, I am very grateful to all the wonderful speakers that we will have in this webinar today. And the, call, the moderator, Kevin, thank you very much. The, and uh, I want to uh, say that the main goal of uh, the International Union of Architects is how to support all the national sections in order that they can help the cities to be in a better uh, development. So we, uh, we believe, strongly believe that health is one of the most important issues. We want cities that are more healthy. We want cities that are more resilient. And if you are more healthy, you are more resilient. Cities that are more equitable, more inclusive, because when we mean inclusive, that means that we take care of the uh, old people you know, in all the cities, and we take care of disabled people. And we want cities that are more sustainable. And if we are more healthy, we will be more sustainable in everything and cities that are more beautiful. So I think the mission of the International Union of Architects is to accomplish all what I have said, but we have to begin with the quality of health. And the health means preventive. You know, we uh, know that in many countries, the people who spend more than 25% of their income in buying medicines and taking care of their health. But that has to be before they get sick, not after. So uh, I am sure that with all the experts that we have today, they can tell us how to behave, what measures we have to take in every place around the world in order to have better quality of life. We are very aware when we are aligned with the United Nations 2030 goals that if we want to have a better planet, you know, if we want to mitigate all the damage that we have been doing to the planet because we have been contaminating the seas, the rivers, you know, uh, taking away a lot of agricultural areas and a lot of forests. So in order to have a better planet, we have to begin with, the, with ourselves and our own communities and our own cities, our own uh, people, you know, to take care of everybody. We know that after the pandemic, you know, we realized that we were going in the in the wrong direction and uh, that is very important to be aware that we were in the wrong direction and we have to correct our way we have to correct our goals and we have to walk in the in the in the right direction so uh, in order to do that we have to implement all your ideas so thank you very much and very welcome all the participants congratulations to everybody i pass the we are at the moment in Cartagena, Colombia. We are having a council meeting of UIA, and this morning, you know, full of sun, beautiful place, uh, is, uh, we are going to work for you. And to, but we need to be all united. So we encourage you to be all united in, with all the working bodies. We have many working groups at UIA and many good commissions, and everybody's working very hard. So if we are all united, we can really transform the quality of life in our cities and in our territories. Thank you very much. I pass the word to Payin.
My warmest greeting from the International Union of Architects, um, Peng Tan, the UIA Secretary General, and it is my great honor to be given this opportunity to address all of you. On behalf of the UIA, I would like to welcome you to the UIA webinar organized by the Public Health Group. The last UIA General Assembly at the end of July 2021 has mandated 2022 as the UIA Year of Design for Health. The mandates include the use of UIA resources to launch an open access digital information hub on designing for improved health, benefiting all nations, to establish an international research agenda to advance the goals of the designing for health, and to support the creation of resources that will help architects conduct research in designing for health. As such, this is one of the key focus of the activities of the UIA this year. As part of the UIA concerted effort and initiatives to promote design for health, the UIA Public Health Group has planned a series of webinars with the aim to empower architects' design process with appropriate research methods for better outcomes so as to protect health, design that develops better health, and designs that restores health. This webinar will be dedicated on the discussions on the design for health with emerging technologies. We are heading towards a more urbanized environment with more than 50% of today's population living in urban areas. This number will rise to more than 70% in 2050. The rapid and ill-controlled urbanization have created a lot of health detrimental issues and caused serious climate change. COVID-19 highlighted the great need for us to transform our design parameters and philosophy. The COVID-19 crisis has not only escalated the adoptions of digital technology, it also highlighted the importance of collaborative, responsive and creative ways for the architects and the other stakeholders, including the public, to work together in a manner to bridge technology, research and design to deliver values. There's a great need and urgency for us to make use of technology to transform and rethink on how our buildings and cities are to be designed. They're more progressive, adaptable, inclusive, and sustainable in line with the SDGs. Design and technolo technology will therefore be the key differentiators and critical tools for enabling the integrations of health and well being into the built environment and policies. This forum, with the assembly of presenters who are experts in this topic, will serve as a great platform for us to share our common values, knowledge, experience, and aspiration. It will also stimulate fruitful discussion, which will result in positive outcomes. We would like to apologize that we will not be able to stay with you for the entire webinar in view that we will be having our UIA Council meeting soon. On behalf of the UIA, I would like to register our greatest appreciation to the moderator, Kelvin Burham, and all the presenters for your valuable contribution towards this very important topic, which is most timely and appropriate. We must also thank the UIA Public Health Group under the capable leadership of the director, Ray Pentecost, assisted by Shi Peng, and also the two very passionate members, Nuina Muhammad Nawawi and Fani Wabili, who have put in tremendous effort in organizing this webinar and the support given by the UIA Secretariat in making this webinar a success. I would also like to thank all the participants for taking variable time off joining us, and I hope the presentation has inspired you to drive for design for health. And before we leave, I would like to introduce our moderator, Kelvin Baham. Kelvin Baham is the Managing Director of the award-winning FGG Architects Incorporated based in Durban, South Africa. He served on the South African Council of the Architecture Profession, where he chairs the Education and Recognition of Clara Learning Committees and served on the International Canberra Accord Executive, a former president of the South African Institute of Architects and the regional SAIA KZN, he has represented South Africa on numerous UIA bodies, including the Council, Professional Practice Commission, and the Public Health Group. Thank you once again. And Kelvin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General Paying. And thank you, President. Lovely to see you again. Uh, and we wish you well with your council meeting that uh, you will be heading to shortly. So thank you very much. Um, as has been mentioned already, there will be other councillors that are on this call that you can see on the screen at the moment, uh, and they will also be leaving us. So, um, Fanny, when you leave us in a while, uh, we wish you well for the meeting as well. Um, so today you've got us for around about two hours. Uh, as Pei Ng has said, I'm based in Durban, South Africa. 
Um, it is a sunny day outside here too, and the image behind you, behind me rather, is of, of Durban. So it's an honor for me to uh, moderate this session today. Uh, this is the last of the of the sessions that we are having thus far, uh, and I believe there are more coming up next year. You'll hear about more of that later from Ray. Can you not hear me? Can you not hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Did you not hear anything that I've said thus far? Yes, we have. I, th I think we were just waving goodbye to oh, okay. our members. Sorry. To Jose and Pei Ying. You had me worried a while. <laughs> so the topic for, for today, and I was going to say this afternoon because it is afternoon for me, but many of you, it is early morning, is uh, designed for health uh, with emerging uh, technologies. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the fourth of the presentations. And the, the format for this afternoon in my time is be, will be the introductions as we have now. We have four speakers and maybe quite aptly, uh, the first speaker um, in, in talking about um, the epidemic that we've recently been through and are still uh, having to deal with um, has been put place in, in, in lockdown in his country in China um, and is un unable to be with us this afternoon uh, and has sent through a recorded version of, of his talk. So we'll have four speakers this afternoon, each speaking for around about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, his one's 20 minutes long. Uh, and then we'll take notes and questions. You are welcome to add uh, questions into the Q&A uh, box, which will be recorded through the office in, in Paris. And I'll take notes myself and as will all of us, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. I'll introduce each of the speakers uh, prior to their uh, talk, uh, and that's really the format for this afternoon. We'll finish off with uh, Dr. Ray Pentecost, uh, giving his overview, not only of this session, but of, of the entirety of these webinars that we've been having thus far. So enjoy yourself, uh, sit back, uh, grab hold of your the copy uh, if you if you wish. And uh, what I'm really hoping to to gain out of the from this, the speakers this afternoon is in terms of uh, uh, emerging technologies is how to stop my head shape changing shape on the back of this images. So if they can give me clues on that, um, I think I will have uh, greatly benefited. So, so onto my, our first presentation, and the office if you'll help me to run the presentation in in the moment. Uh, the presentation is by Dr. Huang Siju, uh, who's in China. He's a practicing architect and professor of architecture. Uh, he's a graduate of the Department of Architecture, Southeast University in Nanjing, China. He earned his PhD from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium and was a visiting scholar in the Department of, of uh, Engineering uh, sorry, architecture as the Faculty of Engineering at Tokyo University in Japan. He is currently Chief Architect Consultant for the China PPR International Engineering Company Limited, where he is in charge of 200 health-related planning and design projects and has 10 national standards for the health sector and published 60 articles on the subject of design and health. He is a member of the Architectural Society of China, the AAC, and of the URA Public Health Group, one of the many one of the many members that serve on this public health group. So, uh, if you will bear with us, we're going to watch a video now for up to twenty minutes. Uh, and Paris office, if you can do the honors, please. Thank you. Good day, everybody. I'm very pleased to be invited as a guest speaker for the final webinar for the URA Year of the Design for Health. 2022. The title of my presentation is Planning and Design Strategy for the Emerging Disease Through Technology. As far as you know, during the past few decades, several uh, epidemics have spread over outbreak all over the world. So the phenomena is during the emerging of the epidemic. The shortage of hospital bed has happened everywhere in the early stage of epidemic outbreaks. A quickly built frontline hospital based on module, standardized, and pre system would provide a solution to fill the gap. Of course, this kind of frontline hospital should be follow the regulations set by national and 
regional codes also, including the biosafety, also structural and non-structural system safety, non-structural system, including the canopy and ceiling, etc. Also the medical case, we call it a life supporting system. Environment safety, including radiology and electromagnetic safety. And for the access shipper, we call it a barrier free, barrier free system also follow. So of course this is a source and is a quick bill hospital, but they have the regulations set by national code and standards to guarantee the quality. This diagram so during the early stage of the epidemic, usually the cases of the infected patient is going very quickly. On the left side is the diagram for the SARS happened in year 2003. And the right side is the COVID-19 of 20, 20 years. From the tops of the curve, you can see during the very short periods, the cases is going rapidly. In this case, they raise the burden of the hospital capacity. Usually, uh, shortage of the hospital beds, including the ICU beds, is very serious. So to build a frontline hospital, they could provide a way to increase the capacity of the hospital service quickly based on the modular standardized and prefigured system and to mitigate the burden on the existing health system and earn more time to cutting down the spreads of the communicable disease. So quite a number of this kind of facility were built during the SARS in 2003, also in COVID-19 start from 20 to 20 up to now. This kind of frontline housing should be follow the systematic approach. So the key point is control from the very beginning up to the end. So we start from the site appraisal and selection. Usually in the site appraisal and selection, we have to make appraisal to find a appropriate location. Of course, in the location, we have to away about environment factor, traffic accessibilities, and this stage, we also estimate, make estimating about the appropriate size of the hospital, the number of hospital heads, also the flexibility for the future expansion. Because at, at the beginning stage, we difficult to make estimation about the appropriate size. We don't know how will happen in the future. And the next step is to make a appropriate master plan. We have make out a general layout. In this state, we have to rationalize allocation of the zoom and make a specified different entrance for the circulation flows. Of course, we have to segregation about the areas and roads because we discuss about biodiversity, have to segregate different zones for the pilot area and also for a area. And next step, I will select available parts and install and assemble them on site. We have to select available building parts, including panel, ceiling, roof, and other ready-made uh, electrical and mechanical parts. Also, we have to make a coordination of an adjustment because uh, in this kind of actually will be in very short periods. So we have to make coordination and adjustment them before they put into runs. Now we discuss about the site appraisal and selection. So the appropriate location should be selected. Uh, this kind of selection not in a dense population area. Of course, uh, this uh, facility have to work together with other original assisting hospital. So the in the left part of the diagram you saw when we built Xiao Tang San Hospital in year 2003, this hospital is built 
on the suburb of the northern part of Beijing have around 32 kilometers between the center part of the city and of course they have related to other hospitals. And this hospital also provide the health service during the, this epidemic happened. The Prana Hospital is work together with the existing hospital together. It's like a health network. For the environment selection, we have to take care about the geology, about the earthquake and landslides, soft soil. We have to select a rather flat and good uh, organization to save the time to less uh, the earthworks. Of course, we have to avoid the floating area. I got the traffic accessible. We have to select the location. We have a available route, easy connect to the health institution. Work together with the other system because uh, at emergency times, they need to transfer the patient from one hospital to another. This uh, example of the Xiao Tanzan Hospital. So the campus have divided different zones. On the upper part is the pilot zones, and the lower part is about the clean zone. In the clean zone, we provide the dormitory for the staff, and dormitory staff work in, during a period, and the dormitory have to divide it to one is for the on-duty staff, and the other is for the staff who are finished the job, but they have to make 40 days observation before they leave uh, the campus. On the upper part is the medical suite for the inpatient. All the patients is arrested in the pilot area. And this campus have provided two entrances on the northwest part and to the southeast part. And this uh, facility have to have appropriate infrastructure because uh, the Xiao Tangshan Hospital, they have original uh, sanatoria building there. So they have uh, some electric spy, uh, water treatment, and other catering system already. But for the infection DC, uh, for the wastewater treatment, they have a big volume. So we choose the original uh, swimming pool for this, uh, make uh, the cover and make some apparatus to renovate it, build as a sewage system. And, and the drawing is a B. So this uh, hospital was built in very quick, and we think about the future expansion on the northeast part. For the master plan, there is another typical uh, example we discussed with you. So in this uh, diagram, you can see very clearly regional zone allocation for the different zone. Upper part if for uh, containment zones, we call it pilot zone, and clean zone is for the lower part. On the upper part, uh, they have uh, inpatient wards, also medical support area, also special arrangement for the ambulance car washing on the entrance of the uh, patient. And for the clean area, we discussed already in the Xiao Tanshan Hospital, we have two, two groups of the dormitory uh, building and divided two parts. Of course, uh, in this bed, have a catering system, also some stores for the drugs, for the foods, and for other necessary uh, supply. Pay attention about the air suction station. It should be located in a pilot area because uh, air suction system is very generous for the, this kind of uh, infection DC. They have to clean the screens regularly. So they have to set in the pilot area. Also, we discuss about the entrance. We have to say, specify different flows. For instance, in this diagram, the patient entrance is out the north, 
and for the pallet materials is uh, on the left and the uh, clean and staff entrance is in the south area. For this kind of uh, master, we have to aware about the uh, influence on the environment. For instance, the local climate, the sunshine, uh, the mainstream of the wind, and other issues. The third part is assembling the building parts. We usually select available assessing building parts. Of course, we could uh, prefigure panel, sandwich panels, container. We can choose also for the inflatable tanks. And for the mechanical and electrical parts, we could choose ready-made power supply vehicle, for instance. Of course, in some city, in China, we alive will have uh, portable city tracks, portable uh, PCR tracks also under other ultrasounds and other facilities. So if available on the local area, we can choose them and erect it in the campus, uh, we can save the times. On construction and installations on the sites, we have uh, carried out under supervision of building information modeling system. Pass through beam system, we can save and make coordinate works more easily and we can uh, find, discover the problem. For instance, for the piping have uh, some problem when they cross each other. Use this kind of system, we can save the time and solve the problem immediately. All the problem happen in the different state have to solve promptly by the working team. So for the working team, the architects not only work individually, they have to work together with the hospital administrator, infectious control specialist, and medical equipment engineer. We have to work together, urban planner, also work together with contractor, supervisor, and work together with all other engineer. So all team have to work together make an effort in order to solve the problem on the site and sort the construction times. So this drawing, I show you the Xiao Tang San Hospital. Xiao Tang San is was built in 2003. They provide uh, 612 beds. Some people so they have uh, 1,000 beds because uh, they calculate in one room have to provide two or three patients, but we prefer at the time we success to fit one or two patients only. The side area is uh, showing the figures and they make use of the prefabricated sandwich panel, but one row they use the ready-made uh, concrete box. So from the building you can see have six rows. They have individual uh, different uh, component because they at that time is very urgent. They are constructed by six different uh, contractor, different company. All the building is one floor, only one floor. It was uh, put in the run every in the use from first of May up to the twenty of June. So according the Statistics, 680 inpatient were accepted and treated in the hospital. Eight of them died. And no medical staff, more than 1,300 staff working there, no one of them were suffer. This uh, picture showing the facility after ready put into run. This figure is the uh, inner part. The left side is the inner staff corridor and interior of the patient rooms. You see the medicals as on the wall. This is the typical layout of nursing wards. From the yellow one in the center corridor, connect to the patient staff living zones, this a clean corridor. So the medical staff have passed through the middle uh, they have uh, two way to the right side have to uh, health uh, control area to have to put on the cloth away on the shoe mask and before they enter to the uh, blue one 
there is a systematic arrangement. So all the patients is in the control in the uh, different uh, nursing wards. In this diagram, they have already have four nursing units. The medical staff enter the patient, pass through the empty room in between two uh, nursing wards. From this uh, figure, you can see different panel is organized, composed the nursing wards. Each uh, two nursing wards have share one empty room. Empty room, the medical staff have uh, to put another isolation mask before they enter to the patient rooms. On the patient is enter the patient room from outside. So they segregate uh, the patient corridor and staff corridor. In the center is the corridor for the medical staff. There's another example for the COVID-19. It was built in 2020. It's Wuhan or Sunshine Hospital. They have followed the similar concept. Of course, uh, they used another solution. They used a prefabricated container to install on sites. Only the foundation is poor on situ. And they have uh, one part on the east and north part. They have uh, two layers. Yeah. For the rest, only one layer. They have improved uh, the location of the ICU and medical supply put in the center. So for the patient, more easy to reach there. In Xiaotang San, because we had to have enough time, uh, the appropriate optimal size occupy the electric uh, transformer. So we put the medical staff in the uh, southeast part. Not easy for the patient to get there. They have to use the trolley to bring the patient to that area for uh, examination. For Wuhan Hospital, they built within the 10 days. And altogether, they admit uh, 2,961, almost uh, 3,000 patients. Uh, also, they have no any staff who are infected in these facilities. So they have, uh, have used the beam to control. This was built in 70 years uh, after the SARS. So they have, uh, have more equipment, more supervision. But I view of the building in each state is very quick to build. It's a different state of the building. Here you can see in this front of the hall, and they also have the ICU. And so they provide the CD scanner in this frontline hospital. Provide the necessary facility for treat the infection disease for the COVID-19 patient. So today, cross-discipline cooperation and interdependence of different process have carried out more possibility and open a gate toward brighter scenario for the health architecture. So in future, I think we have more advanced technology. Various kind of uh, technology will support us to build better health facility to save human health, also to improve our health facility, health system. So I make a list for the main reference of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. Uh, that um, presentation was so uh, crisp, I actually thought he was with us and I was thinking of asking questions, but I'm uncertain if he is on the um, call with us at the moment, but um, either way, we uh, will come to Q&A at the end. Um, I've got lots of points and lots of notes I made down there, so I will uh, be kicking off some questioning at the end for you all. Our second speaker uh, of today is um, born in Cairo, is Hannah Dahi, is a registered German architect who completed her PhD at the University of Stuttgart between 2010 and 2014. She studied architecture and engineering, architectural engineering, in Cairo with excellence and honors in uh, 2003 and obtained her master's degree in 2006. As part of her professorship, Dahi founded the 
uh, and led the biomats departments, um, biomaterials and material cycles and architecture uh, in faculty one of the University of Stuttgart in mid-2016. She then founded and managed her biomats at Copenhagen Research Center at Aalborg University in 2022, this year, uh, in the framework of her current professorship there, as well as her newly initiated technology transfer company sector named Biomats TGU at TTI uh, GmbH in Stuttgart, also initiated in, this year in 2022. She has established her first office in Cairo since 2003. She holds European and international patents, won the Materialica Prize Award for Design and Technology in 2015 in Munich, and the Materials Prize Awards of the Design Center Baden-Württemberg in 2016, 2018, 2021, and 22. Uh, 2023 is coming, uh, as well as the excellence and teaching senior fellowship awards uh, 2016 and 17, and the excellence award for women of outstanding achievements in the architecture and construction sector of 2020, as well as receiving a number of research industrial grants and as a member of several European and international scientific professional associations. Hannah, a good intro and fantastic uh, efforts. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for the introduction and many thanks for the invitation. Uh, I hope you can see my screen and in a complete modus, we, I hope. We can, thank you. Yes, okay. So allow me please to take you through a journey uh, also in the area of design for health, but uh, here from another perspective. So unlike the previous presentation that directly dealt with hospitals and how to manage that also in the crisis of the corona, here um, the, the approach is a bit different, but it all leads to the same way of how we try to serve our community in terms of preserving uh, energy resources and also at the end for the sake of the well-being and health. So in this journey, the, the materials will be the key and the, the soul of the overall presentation. And um, allow me please to take you through and see how this uh, was approached in our case. Um, we know well these numbers, and that's the reason why uh, the materials was chosen to be the, the hero of uh, the whole way of solving the, uh, the issue linked to our health because of the very high, um, um, yeah, let's say the bad reputation of architecture and the building industry, generally speaking, when it comes to the amount of resources consumption and waste production, energy consumption, carbon dioxide emissions. And that was the reason for the necessity of thinking of a major problem, which is resources. And why are we only relying on steel and concrete aggregates and uh, conventional materials in that way that is uh, running out anyway and we need to search for other ways of uh, seeing renewable resources as alternatives for uh, the way we build. And through that context the biomed community was initiated and achieving the so-called design philosophy materials as a design tool was there. So there was an approach of integrating three main poles for that system, which is integrating materials and fabrication systems as inputs in our design process. And you will see through the following slides in which way this was sensed and approached. Um, the possibility of uh, integrating lightweight structures and uh, reducing the amount of materials we use in the first place in architecture and uh, reaching to other kinds of um, alternative materials that are coming from annually renewable resources like plant fibers was one of the main tasks that was uh, seen to be uh, a way to improve the well-being and to improve the health conditions um, in relation to the amount of energy used and the amount of materials consumed by turning into those kind of alternative resources. But using emergent technologies was a main key to approach that and seeing what kind of industries that have been um, leading the way before uh, architecture. I mean, in, in other contexts, let's say that in other kinds of industries, like you'll see later in automotives and aircraft design, there was a very big 
uh, development taking place. And if we compare it to the developments we had it in our field, in the building industry, in architecture, you will see a very big gap that we are still relying on old ways of building and conventional materials, unlike what happened in the other mentioned industries. And through all that, we approached many research fields, or mostly lying in the area of dealing with materials as a start point and not with the geometries. So unlike classic architectural ways of design that we make a geometry as a start, no, we see what kind of local resource we have in the first place, and then we go through a, cer a certain kind of circular design approach to uh, cover up ways of uh, form finding to see possibilities of approaching architecture differently. And in that way, composites and computational design, lightweight design, additive fabrication techniques, all of using emergent technologies have been applied in that context. So as you see here, the amount of integration of developments and technologies have been taken from uh, other disciplines and a kind of multidisciplinary approach was one of the key um, roles in, into that way, into that path, by taking developments that already did take place in other industries like the, air, the aircraft and automotives, textile industries, and many others, also the plastic manufacturing industry, uh, additive manufacturing technologies, automation, and so on. Those were taken as leaders uh, to our approach, and we uh, managed through collaboration to reach different innovative methods and reaching to different ways of how we deal with architecture and uh, our solutions. One of the ways is dealing with the design space differently and uh, reducing materials consumption through topology optimization and using parametric design models to refine the design and to use simulation to uh, know where are the highest deformation happening inside a, um, a geometry and to reduce the materials from one point, but to reinforce it in another point. And uh, for instance, through this uh, manufacturing technology, the 3D printing technology that is applied in, de in this uh, design workflow, the tool, uh, the tool path was generated and this influences the way we approach our designs. Also, many points like designing for reusability, designing for recyclability and disassembly and applying a modular systems was one of the major tasks that we took in, uh, in integration to the usage of alternative building materials like you'll see also later. Furthermore, as already mentioned, many kinds of fabrication technologies adapted from other uh, industries were integrated in our scope and applied through both small scale and large scale, meaning small scale like in the area of indoor applications, floating system, cladding system, furniture, but also large scale like complete buildings and even bridges, as you will see later. So what took me or struck me even in person um, regarding my own personal experience on that was this photo. I show it almost in every presentation that presents what's happening as a disaster in one of the um, um, sectors, which is the agricultural sector, that all over the world, because this photos or the four photos are actually from four different continents, the US, from Chile, from Spain, in Europe, from China. So it's it's a worldwide unfortunate practice that happens in within the uh, process of the um, farmers getting rate out of the uh, cereal straws in open fields, causing extra carbon dioxide because they, they see it as a kind of waste and, and they want to get rid out of it from the uh, open lands or to find uh, uh, space for the coming agricultural season. And what is exactly going here is that destruction of resources is taking place while in another industry like our building industry, we need those kinds of resources because the inner component of it is very similar to timber, which is the thing that, that took me as an architect into the idea of trying to search for myself for uh, solutions using fabrication technologies coming from the plastic manufacturing technique and from the timber systems and trying to find a means by making fiber uh, boards like this one that could be bent and fixed in, in different orientations using the recycled straw fibers instead of burning it. 
And that's why the first development, which was later called bioflexi, was one of the approaches that I took in my PhD time and then took forward further in um, the biomed after it's, uh, it was established. So the idea here in this case was to use the short fibers and to compound it with a thermoplastic elastic polymer, which is known in the area of the plastic manufacturing industry, and to receive something that is a dream for every architect and designer, something that could be bent and fixed in all orientations, almost. And um, it was taken upwards further into other uh, upscaling procedures in, in a, uh, a project that was uh, funded later. As you see in the photo, it was upscaled and then it was uh, reinforced by veneer and it took the fiberboard uh, that core into another level uh, to a structural uh, application possibilities that you will see later. And uh, in parallel, also in another project, the uh, instead of having a kind of elastomer or elastic uh, flexible bend, bendable uh, uh, fiberboard, Another version was made like a stiff uh, fiber board, which could be laser cut and thermoformed. And we created through this a multifunctional sandwich panel with integrated insulation properties, either acoustically or thermally. And through that major uh, uh, or like a real series of production and projects took place, like this one that was um, given to uh, the students. Then in a later stage, the know-how was transferred and they were given the chance to use the real materials to further develop on that. And um, you see that the outcome was fabulous and different um, uh, layers of, of making products, uh, architecture products out of that were reached. And the uh, know-how was further on transferred, not only using those materials, but in an experimental approach, it was seen how far one can go using minimum materials and to reach different architectural uh, applications. Here you see only smaller exercises in the form of chairs, but they only present the concept of larger construction systems. Um, fibrous systems were one of them because we intended to use alternative fibers. So unlike the previous given examples of having recycled straw fibers, further kind of fibers like hemp and flax and uh, other kind of uh, so-called industrial natural fibers have been applied. The one on the right is carbon fibers, but the idea itself of using fibrous architecture was there and was implemented. And even growing materials was applied, as in this example. So we applied mycelium, which is known for its roots, that it's a growing material. And we had the possibility to control its growth direction. Again, it's almost with no cost. So we have a simple material that is based on microorganisms that eat uh, straw fibers or other kinds of fibers and then grow in a certain orientation, just like mushroom. And through the roots, they hang on the um, structure system that you see on the right um, below uh, photo, which presents the rattan here, another biomaterial used as a frame or a skeleton system. And the outcome, we got a small structure system as an experimental approach to see how far those systems could really take weights. And as said, the approach here was not to fabricate uh, furniture. It's uh, to experiment uh, industrial approaches towards lightweight structure systems. And then, a wide variation took place. Like we experimented lots of variations on a small scale, and then we went upscale to making full construction systems. So for this example, this was used with the same idea of the bioflexi that we have a flexible uh, fiber board in the middle, and then we cover it up and down by means of veneer. So the overall mechanical properties completely change. And in this scope, a span of 10 meters and a height of 3.5 meters were reached. And in this, um, this small uh, uh, shell construction, uh, we were able to tackle so many variations within the, uh, within the building industry field because we covered many aspects about how far we go using molding systems um, that we um, uh, excluded the usage of so many molding systems in that. You can just imagine that um, uh, to reach these kinds of uh, 
elastic uh, and curvature. We needed molds to apply um, uh, pressing molding technique, but we managed to make more than 370 different pieces using only four molds for the whole construction. We also applied through collaboration with the colleagues of the Technical University of Eindhoven, uh, the simulation to understand how this shell construction that is uh, built out of more than 370 pieces and segments, how the deformation might happen and how to reinforce that further using only veneer. And even within the construction itself, we were able through the collaboration with the colleagues of the engineering geodesy to make a 3D scanning of the overall site and to make through site analysis an exact quality control and quality assurance as the structure was being built to examine and know exactly if there is any failure or mistake while the components are being locked together. Because we must have at the end, a this overall shell uh, technique, the, the structure itself should be very well connected and should not have a flattened surface or else a big deformation will happen. And through that a quality assurance was reached and this level of accuracy was reached. So within the whole system, we did not only uh, develop the, the materials and the fabrication and the overall idea, but we developed different ways of how to handle, how to build with this alternative building material, and this belonged to the whole system. You just see how it looked like at the beginning and on the upper right part. Uh, the the molds are seen. It's just only four molds for all these different curved pieces, and all those legs were connected in a certain order. And here you see only part of the team, but more than eighty people were involved in this project. It took uh, um, almost one complete year, over two semesters, and one semester was for design, and the other was for the construction. But then we went into many approaches, including also larger infrastructure. We were one of 15 partners inside another project that is called Smart Circular Bridge. And this is um, uh, directed from the Technical University of Eindhoven. But all in all, we are five universities and seven companies and three cities. And the three cities are the cities in which the um, uh, the the uh, uh, bridges are going to be built in. One is already finished and opened in uh, Almere in the um, uh, in in an open event that has to deal with uh, uh, it's called Floriade Expo, and uh, it had a span of fifteen meters and a width of three meters. And what you see here in gray, this is not concrete. This is biocomposites, but it had to have a coating that unfortunately was a bit at the end similar to concrete, but this is completely made of a biocomposite system. Um, as said, the whole project uh, needs to be finished by um, the end of next year, but the first bridge was already uh, constructed and opened um, on the day of, on, on the Earth Day this year. And the second one is coming in Germany in a city called Ulm. And the third one is coming by the end of next year in bergen Optum, also in Netherlands. And my role here um, as the director of Biomed, I'm playing the role of the architect for the three bridges. But there is a very large number of expertise in this project from other colleagues. And here is the Almere, the, the Floriade Expo, in which the uh, bridge was opened, the one of um, uh, Almere. Um, and here you see our design, um, and uh, the design, of course, was collaboration between many partners because, as said, the, um, the limitations of the fabrication system used for the winding of the handrail of this um, bridge had to be involved as well in our design. This is the bridge body itself. It's made of foam and wrapped on it all over flax fibers. And inside it, it was uh, connected with 100 sensors through which um, the evaluation of the uh, deformation loads and uh, how the loads are being distributed among the body of the bridge is being controlled. And it can see in real time on an online dashboard, uh, it's public available. You can all see it online in the dashboard.smartcircularbridge.eu. 
And this is um, during the uh, installation, as you see, uh, to mount the whole bridge, only one crane was needed. And this um, showcases the lightness of the bridge. It will be monitored for a whole 10 years and uh, it is a durable bridge. This is not a temporary structure. And this is a photo that shows um, many of the partners on the bridge. It's just only the partners are here. So there are no external people in this photo. You just see the number of people who needs to be involved to create that kind of development. And the coming bridge is coming in Ulm and it's very near to the uh, very famous Ulm Cathedral. This is a special technique that I'd like to show, which is called tailor fiber placement. And it is taken from the textile um, industry and from the aircraft industry, which is basically fibers that are being stitched on a stretched membrane. And this is in a flattened form. And then the fibers are taken into another level of molding. This is a super ultra light system that is created here because we exactly define where the loads are and we put the fibers where the, 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 the forces will flow. And you can see the kind of architecture that could get out of this, that's minimalization, that's very, very minimum. So you can see this is a freestanding uh, structure system that could be applied uh, in surfaces and bus stations and so on. And we reduced all the kind of materials that we do not need and exactly defined the material through the fibers that were applied by stitching. And at the end, it was a collaboration between many partners, including colleagues from aircraft and including structural engineers. And it holded a weight of only 35 kilograms at the end and had that size in comparison to the human scale, as you see. And we went into so many versions and variations on expanding and testing this kind of development, seeing uh, discretization, modularity, seeing how far this could uh, reduce the weights of structure systems and seeing uh, what kind of connections could be applied there, how to apply um, the disconnection and reconnection of the modular units and how to improve the folding systems by even implementing further approaches like biomimicry. You see here that we implemented through collaboration with master students and also with colleagues of another university uh, how to solve uh, or how to put the fibers in a certain order to allow its folding pattern to happen, just like a fly, uh, just like an insect that has its wing bending and folding. So through analysis and abstracting the folding pattern of just an insect wing, it was possible to implement even folding patterns happening just through fibers. And this reduced further the necessity of applying molds because we know in concrete and in other kinds of um, building materials, we need a lot of molds. And even in that case, it was one of our uh, approaches to eliminate completely the mold uh, through uh, indicating or including folding patterns. And this happened by applying biomimicry um, concepts and this allowed us to reduce the molds and uh, getting away from it through applying even only very thin frames and wires as you see thanks to the folding pattern integrated and at the end we received a very light weight it's just a couple of kilograms of, of grams that could hold a weight of a complete human being up till 100 kilograms and as said this is not meant to be a complete industry for furniture it's meant to examine structure systems and, and further on that thing that's um, i'm sorry yes just... i yes i will i will uh, end it up uh, i think that because of time i will just mention this uh, automation possibility and we'll leave it further for discussion this is using the same technique uh, of um, folding and of applying the tailoring system. And we managed to include uh, elastic hinges and to include motion in our louver system and also to include automation technologies and integration of robotic assembly in our systems. I will end it up to there and 
uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion further later on. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much, Hannah. I could sit and listen to this all day long, and I'm so sure could the others as well. Very interesting, and I think you're very blessed to be able to fulfill this role. Uh, your, your, your day looks far more exciting than mine. So uh, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you in a moment, uh, if you will, bear with us. The, uh, the third speaker for today is uh, Cliff Harvey. I spent quite a lot of time on these webinars with Cliff. Uh, Cliff Harvey is, is based in Canada. He's a practicing architect specialized in healthcare design. As a senior architect at the Ontario government and senior hospital executive, he collaboratively leads the planning, design, and implementation of capital infrastructure projects using advanced management methods for complex projects and building holistically upon governance, strategy, project management, planning, design, and procurement policies. An international expert on health and design, he is currently the Chief Planning Officer for Niagara Health and is leading the development of the new South Niagara Hospital. He is today Acting Director of the UIA uh, Public Health Group, uh, UIAPG, I hope this is not an old message I've got here, and uh, Founding Director of the Canadian Cells, uh, Centre for Healthcare Facilities and also serves as Chair and Vice Chair on a number of Canadian uh, standards associations committees over to you cliff great well thank you very much kevin um just a head nod and can you hear me okay yeah okay clear. perfect thank, thank you. you i first of all like to thank the uh, uia for this opportunity to present to you and share uh, my knowledge uh, and experience on our project but uh, i'd also like to thank um Norwina and Fanny for organizing these. Um, my topic is designing mega projects with emerging technologies and challenges. And when we think mega projects, we think of mega costs, mega risks, mega investments. Um, so we had to consider all those. Um, a major hospital in Ontario is a major investment uh, for the future. So how do we build this in? But before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am on the land um, that I stand on today is a traditional Territories of many, many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is uh, covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississauga of the Credits. Uh, you saw this today, or we talked about it today, but one of the things that I think is very important uh, as we go into um, uh, the year of health. Uh, we have three major goals, which is to design to protect health, develop health, and restore health. And often people think about hospitals only in the last context of restoring and protecting um, our health. But when you invest this type of money into uh, the future of a community, uh, you have to look into how you actually do this larger schedule. So from my perspective, uh, the UIA, by embracing uh, this initiative this year and into the future, uh, is sending a clear message that when we design our built environment, we have to take all into consideration. So here's the learning objectives I'm trying to get across, and I'll apologize to uh, for the number of slides that I'll speak very quickly, but I think as Kevin mentioned, these slides will be available with the references for everybody. I want to talk about the fact is that with these investments uh, that we make into new hospitals and are into all buildings, uh, we have to look at continuous focus on research, and I really appreciate the last um, presentation and the one before that, as we look at different challenges that we have in the world and how do we build that into what we do. I think the takeaway I'm looking for is how do you set up a project to be successful, not only in day one, but far into the future? And how do you manage something that you don't know yet, like emerging technologies? I will say what we've done is a, a, a mixture of evidence-based design research and re, uh, research influence design, meaning that uh, very similar to, again, the previous presentation, uh, we're looking at emerging technologies uh, on many fronts and how do we build those into our design process. I will say that to be successful, the research portion of any project must occur in the early planning stages to be guide the development of the program and design. This is really important in the sense that building and establishing partnerships with universities and other research uh, organizations as you start to develop your project helps you understand uh, how to actually uh, incorporate and integrate the emerging technologies. I also like to use the 80-20 rule. Um, this is the fact is that 80% of what we do is standardized. 
Uh, I will talk about the Canadian Standards Association, how it's built into the actual design process. But I'll have to say, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We really need to focus on the 20%. That is how we're going to make a difference to achieve our big goals, including future-proofing our projects. We need to identify this 20% and stay on top of it all through the design process. And my argument is that our 20% becomes part of the 80% for the future and allowing next projects to focus on the 20 as a collaborative effort of the entire industry to move us forward. I throw this in here because uh, speaking to architects, I often ask, what quadrant do you play in? And these, this is the, where we see how research is built into um, the way the practice and way architects practice and way I would say hospitals uh, project management practices. Um, a lot of people talk about Edison um, as being, especially in North America, being a, um, a major inventor. But in fact, he applied most of his research, most of the intervention came from other people. Um, and a good foil to that is Tesla, uh, who actually did a lot of the research, but didn't necessarily produce uh, a lot of innovation in terms of materials. Um, what we like to look at is a Pasteur quadrant, and everybody's probably familiar with Pasteur in the sense that he not only developed um, pasteurization, but applied it in research, and applied it to commercial products. That's where they can move forward very quickly in the industry. Uh, so I'd like to think about the fact is that where do you work uh, in terms of bringing forward technology into the project? Really quickly about our project, uh, we're located in uh, Niagara Falls, uh, Ontario, Canada, just on the border of the U.S., uh, serving about 400,000 people. This still serves a southern part of the Niagara region. Uh, it's a very large project, 1.2 million square feet, 469 beds, with a few focuses on Center of Excellence and Complex Care, well as in aging, stroke, and geriatric psychiatry. But we also will be the first well-certified, hopefully, um, well-certified hospital uh, in Canada. We're working towards that um, when we open uh, in 27-28. If you're familiar with planning in a public health care system, you realize that uh, you have to work to a, a planning process. And just to note that where we are right now is uh, between working drawings um, at stage four, which is the implementation the RFP, uh, and construction, and we're just awarding our, our construction, design construction um, contract uh, as we speak. Uh, we're in negotiations for that, and it is a P3 project, a design, build, finance, and maintain project, so we'll work with our uh, selected partners to uh, design and build the facility. I will note here, there's two things that we're working on right now is focusing on stage six, the operations. So we're already moving past the construction uh, into how we'll operate within the facility based upon all the work that we've done going back to 2014 when we originally planned the hospital. I will note when I'm, I talked about the 80-20 rule, 80% uh, of our uh, design comes from uh, standards that are developed on a national basis in Canada uh, on the Canadian Standards Association. And there's a number, a suite of them. Uh, I myself uh, volunteer as a member and a chair on a number of these committees, and these inform the design. So that's my 80-20 rule. This is what we already have. Let's make it better. So what I'm going to talk about really quickly is how we came up to, came to build in uh, what I call emerging technologies. And technologies, a lot of people think it in terms of um, uh, information communication, uh, they think about computers, but I take technology as being all knowledge. Uh, again, we learn a lot from these uh, presentations and how do you build knowledge of emerging uh, issues into your project. The way we started back in 2019 when I first joined uh, Niagara Health was actually looking at how the project holistically addresses, as we talked about restore, protect, um, and develop health, how would the project work in terms of the community? This is a tool that was developed by Dialogue and the Conference Board of Canada. And it looks, you'll see in the middle where it's community well-being, you'll see the five factors looking at social, environmental, economic, cultural, and political health. This is extremely important to us because again, this is a major investment into the community. How do we develop this? this tool was excellent because it allowed us to go ahead and start uh, with a uh, a lot of engagement, and I'd love to spend a, a 20 or 30 minutes talking about how to successfully engage a community, uh, but I'll save that for another time, but it's an important aspect. Um, and I, I think it's interesting, I point out here, this was developed in, in 2019, but again, the statement that's in the box, a campus is more than a hospital, it's a place for prevention, healing, and recovery. And I think one of the things that uh, this was 2019 before the, the, uh, the year of health, 
for the UIA, but in fact, uh, the tools exist that we already have. I'll just point out that what we, this will take us to all, and again, again, I apologize, a lot of information, I'm gonna talk quickly, but again, this is all available on our website. And there's a slide that will allow people to go to our website to look at this and uh, on top of other um, uh, reports. But basically we wanted to look at the theme. So I'm just gonna talk really quickly here about number one, which was community health and wellness. So looking at the bigger aspect, but also looking and focusing on number two, uh, patient, family and staff experience. On top of that, we wanted to look at excellence in senior health and wellness. And then number four, accessibility, safe, and inclusiveness. And I saw I started um, the presentation with a land acknowledgement. And right now, one of the big things that we're really focusing on is addressing the health and well-being for our Indigenous population uh, in the community and in their engagement and involvement in the project. Uh, they've been an important partner, um, not only uh, for uh, addressing health issues in their community, but as a community in larger. Again, there's a lot to learn from the cultures that exist uh, surrounding us. Our number five was environmental leadership. Um, and we looked at uh, how we would look at greenhouse gases reducing uh, impact on both um, uh, our building, from our building, I should say, in terms of uh, construction. Again, a uh, lovely uh, presentation prior to mine that actually talked about how the building can change uh, the uh, impact on the environment uh, through materials but also looking at our energy use, um, a sustainability and resiliency. And number six was efficiency and innovation and how we would actually put in uh, what a lot of people focus on in hospitals in terms of the technology, uh, health records, uh, medical, um, medical technology automation. And we looked at that from that perspective. All these came together in our project goals. Um, and I think what's important is that, uh, as Kevin mentioned previously, I worked uh, as a senior architect for the Ministry of Health for over a decade in Ontario. Uh, I was a technical lead for the development of projects throughout the province, almost 120 different hospital and healthcare projects. And one thing I often come across is that people develop their goals. Um, they sound very similar to every other project goals but then nobody measures them. Nobody actually follows them through at the end and say, how successful were we? I will make a note there. Um, the Canadian Standards Association just put out a brand new standard called uh, uh, focusing on design research and post office evaluation. And I think it's an important aspect to talk about design research because that's what I'm talking about is that it, through the design process, we're continuously researching and improving. And what we have to understand is actually how do we measure the success of these? The trouble I have is that uh, our hospital will be opening again 27, 28. Um, by time the lessons are learned, we measure them a year later, we're 2030, we're eight years away from where we are today. So it's so important for us to measure these throughout the entire project and report back on them. And so these goals became performance metrics for the entire project. And I'll go to the next slide, which actually said that fact is that what we're looking at is um, recommendation coming out 29 is that we develop design reports and guideline documents. And this was an important aspect. So what we did was we took all project goals and we started to develop a set of reports. I mentioned earlier that this was uh, available on our website. So down the right hand side, you'll see our um, website address. And then we developed through a bunch of RFPs, individual um, project reports to focus on the goals, what we wanted to achieve, how we wanted to achieve them. I think this is a really important aspect that's often overlooked. Often you, you put out an RFP for a single architect and you ask them to achieve all your goals. Chances are, as the project gets faster, um, busier, um, you have more focus on getting the project done, you have less focus on what you want to achieve. So what we did was we set out very clear guidelines that we set up of these reports, we set our goals within them, and we will measure them throughout the project. Uh, I'll just make a note that we have a number of consultants who are working on the project. Right now, Stantec is our major architectural firm that's supporting us through the RFP process. But in times we had dialogue working with us, we had WSP uh, engineering to our environmental, I'll speak to that. Uh, we had um, uh, B and H architects as well do workplace strategy. Um, and I think it's really important that you bring a diversity of thought. Uh, we often talk about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusiveness in the process. And one of the most important part of that 
from my perspective, is a diversity of thought. Um, often you don't necessarily get that from talking just to one consultant. Um, they're experts in what they do, but you bring together a bunch of, of thoughts, leaders together, and, and focus on what your project statements are, and then you execute that through the process. So I'm going to go really quickly through this part, um, but I just want to talk to you how we actually um, turn this into from design reports into actually their project goals. So protect health. How are we protecting health? Well, the first one is pretty obvious. We had our environmental report that looked at the, the uh, eight uh, project goals that we wanted to look at um, in terms of uh, energy, um, efficiency, water efficiency, water reduction. You'll see materials and products. You'll see transportation, landscape, and health. These set the goals that we wanted to achieve, and then actually through the RFP process to find our, our partner to build the project, these became clearly measurable goals. Again, WSP was our partner on this one, and that report is available for everybody who wants to go on, on, uh, on the site to see it. I will note here, they did an excellent job in doing case studies, both national and internationally, and those are available for anybody who wants to start this process. I will also say uh, we focused on, on resiliency and climate change. And we were one of the first hospitals in Ontario to actually put together a climate hazard risk and resiliency assessment, which helped to inform the design. We didn't do this after, but we did it prior to, and we did a number of things that helped us understand exactly how our hospital uh, will have to react in the future, um, particularly as climate change is a reality. Unfortunately, uh, we have to prepare for it. Then I want to just talk quickly about developing health. Again, when you often think of a hospital, you often think of it as some place to go to restore your health. But we looked at it as being an investment in the community. So how do you develop health? And particularly focusing on staff and physicians. Our workforce is over 4,000 people. We saw well certification as a way to actually measure and look at our performance in terms of how uh, we will respond to that. Well, that well could be a whole another um, presentation, um, and there's a lot of information about it. Uh, you can go to, um, to get into our website to look at this. But this is important because I always look at lead as being about the building and being being sustainable, and how we build um, our future. I see well as being the lead for the environment for the staff and physicians and how we actually address their needs. I also say we looked at workplace strategy. And that's an important thing. So I mentioned B&H Architects with their partners advanced strategy to look at how we want to work inside the facility. Often we focus on the patients and they're very important. I'll talk about them in a moment. But how do staff and physicians, how do we develop the health of the people who will work in the building? A very important aspect. And last, not, not just last, but just another example of that, um, economic development. We all recognize the political and the economic health of a, a, an area, of a country, of a nation uh, is important, very important and has an impact on the health. We looked at it from a regional perspective and we looked and developed with a Niagara Economic Development um, key tools to help develop businesses and support economics uh, development to develop health as a key foundation. And the last item I would speak to is actually restoring health. And this one's pretty straightforward in the sense that from restoring health, we know that hospitals uh, look at how we operate, and that is giving patients, families, caregivers, staff and physicians to give a safe and high quality environment. So we looked at um, the fact is that uh, this is a first milestone for um, Ontario. We'll have 100% single patient rooms. Uh, we'll look at uh, growth into the future to support um, emerging technologies uh, from a healthcare perspective. And we'll look at uh, how we use a well certification to support this. I will note um, one of the areas that we looked at is the Indigenous House. We looked at it early in the project from a, a program point of view. Uh, when we developed RFP, we looked at how we included Indigenous artists and architects in the actual designing of the facility. And then as we go into the actual construction, we're looking at the workforce and engagement plans. So important aspect of this is just one of the many communities that we serve, but we'll just give a good example of how we integrate um, our partners into the actual design process. And then another uh, our uh, design firm that we worked with was Pivot um, and helped us design our patient journeys, uh, a key element to the experience of using the entire hospital. Uh, often we think of the hospital again as a singularity um, and a place where you go, but we recognize that the, the patient experience and the patient travel starts at the home, 
it arrives at our our parking lots how they facilitate the building so wayfinding becomes a major key to actually using technology to help the wayfinding system and reduce the stress of the experiment just wrapping up now this is one of my most favorite aspects of it which is uh all that is great but if you can't manage it you can't the saying is if you, you can't measure it you can't manage it this is our roadmap that we developed at the beginning of the project uh it's eight feet tall by 30 feet long and maps out everything that we need to do in terms of deliverables each one of these deliverables where there's over a thousand here represents a task uh, and reports and consultants and you can see from the picture of the right, it's all integrated in terms of the fact is there's 18 workflows that we have to manage. Um, ICT, information technology is just one of them, FF&E and the relationship between technology and equipment. And we draw them, we drew this and you can see from the diagrams, it goes up and down, it goes across. This is how we learned how to integrate all the work that we were doing. I think it's important. We did a number of reports I talked about how do we integrate those? How do we integrate consultants? And one of the things I often say is that uh, you integrate tasks, but you don't integrate people. People collaborate. And this is, goes back to my thought about diversity of thought. So we had to work towards how we actually create a collaborative team. I'll just leave the, with this thought is that I often use the idea of design thinking, but then actually working at how you do a learning um, organization. And you'll see system thinking, mental model, personal mastery, team learning, and shared vision. Today, I just talked about the uh, shared vision that we created to, to incorporate technology and future thinking into the building, but that there's a understanding that uh, how you create your team and how you work and manage the project is extremely important to actually achieving your goals. So I'll leave it there, but I will say, as we build technology into the building, foresight is needed more than ever, and our ability to map out our future, as we did with this project, is extremely important to integrate and collaborate right across the spectrum of people. So thank you very much for sharing, letting me share this information with you. Thanks very much, Cliff. Uh, good timing. Um, for those that don't design hospitals or, or know hospital sizes necessarily, your 469 bed hospital is a, a very large hospital. We had uh, the first uh, speaker spoke about a thousand bed hospital uh, or 612 in another instance. And those are massive hospitals. Um, the largest one I've ever done is 400 beds. So, so really large, large hospital. So um, very impressive. Um, and we hope to follow the uh, track of your of that implementation as well. Um, and you've given some very good references there, uh, reading material as well. Thank you. Um, I was interested in your, your eight foot by 30 foot uh, wall that you had there. And it's um, involved in education as I am. We try and Steer, everyone's working on CAD nowadays, and we try and get the, particularly the first year students to draw by hand, just so the hand eye coordination and, and the thinking of the hand and scale come to play. So it's so lovely to see something on a wall that's been drawn on. Uh, so keep doing it, is what I encourage you. So thank you. Um, our fourth and last speaker uh, for today is uh, Dr. Narit Philosoph, who's an architect, researcher, and healthcare design consultant, a fellow of the Cambridge Digital, Digital uh, Innovation and associate of the Cambridge Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. She is also a lecturer at the uh, Collar uh, School of Management at Tel Aviv University, where she teaches healthcare design at the MBA level in the Health Systems Management Program. She possesses postdoctorate degrees from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, McGill University, and the Center for Health Design in the US. Uh, as a project manager at uh, leading Israeli and Canadian architectural firms, she won international awards, including the Academy of Architects for Health Award from the American Institute of Architects, the American Hospital Association, and Graduate uh, Fellowship, and the Israeli foundation fellowships. Nirit, thank you for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Kevin. And I really want to thank the UIA Public Health Group for the invitation to present to you my work. I'm really honored to be with you today. Um, as, as Kevin mentioned in the introduction, I'm an architect and a researcher uh, working in the field of healthcare design. And my current associations are actually with business schools 
and uh, also working uh, as the head of research and innovation and transformation at Shiba Medical Center in Israel. And in a way, it reflects my uh, attempt, I would say, to, to overcome the gap between academic research and architectural practice, and also to really develop multidisciplinary collaborations uh, in research between healthcare or medicine, management, and architecture. I was always fascinated with the challenge of planning for an unknown future change. Um, Kev, uh, Cliff mentioned it in his uh, talk that we, we plan um, um, building to last decades, even maybe a century, and we really don't know what the future will bring even in, in the next few years. And it's not only change in medicine or in science, and obviously in technology that the built environment has to support, but it's also changes in, the, in our perception of what is health and care, what is our social and cultural norms, our uh, values and belief, what do we need in order to heal? Over the years, we moved from designing uh, hospitals as factories, um, focusing on process-centered care, into healing environment, aiming to create a human-centered care, not only for the patients, but also for the family members and the staff. The paradigm of disease treatment in highly specialized hospitals has shifted to health promotion in our natural environment and in all building typologies. We moved from central mega hospitals into community healthcare centers, creating a more human scale environment, which is close to home. And we also have been developing smart hospital environment that are um, following the approach of predictive and personalized medicine, trying to create an adaptive environment that will respond to our personal needs. And recently during COVID, we really witnessed uh, a major transformation of telemedicine, the acceleration of remote care, the idea of healthcare without walls, and the move to hospitalization, which was really enabled by digital technologies and remote care technologies, um, following an approach of seeing the patient as a consumer. This transformation led to uh, uh, a change in the conception of hospitals uh, into a healthcare ecosystem. And here you can see this poster that I really like from the beginning of COVID, showing how med technologies, startups in Israel will, will be able to harness COVID. And what it shows that the care and, and uh, the, the services of healthcare is not, now, is not limited only to the hospital, but it actually takes place in very diverse uh, environment, whether it's in our home or in our office, or even in, um, in social and urban uh, environments. And this really brings a question, how do we design hospitals taking account this transformation in, in remote care? And current discussions really look at how uh, the demands will change. I think Cliff was also mentioning that. Um, we think about if at the future we will have to have waiting rooms if most of the care will be remote and a lot of the processes will be digital and much more efficient. We recognize that hospitals will be mostly for acute and critical care because most of the other healthcare services will take place outside of the hospital. But I really want to argue that the transformation will be much more significant. I think we will see uh, a change in the conception of what is the hospital in the future. And to study this transformation, um, we built a research collaboration between uh, the Judge Business School and the University of Cambridge in the UK with Shiba Medical Center in Israel, looking at smart hospital of the future. And really it's the integration of digital technologies, service innovation and hospital design. So if you think about it, it's very simple, the intersection between healthcare technology and architecture. 
So the study took place at Chiba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in Israel, and it's also rated as one of the best 10 hospitals in the world. And during COVID, they realized that they can use remote technologies, not only for our patient care, taking care of patients outside of the hospital, but also for inpatient care in the COVID units. And they developed a new model of care, which was really, uh, uh, I think, innovative in, in its approach to divide a space into a contaminated zone and a clean zone. And they used a lot of digital technologies to um, um, remotely monitor the patients, to uh, manage the staff, and to support the staff working in the contaminated zone with the PPE. Remote care by telemedicine technologies and robots really helped them overcome limitations of physical visibility. We always design a medical unit based on uh, how far can we see in order to control the operation. And here, remote visibility, virtual visibility, overcome this limitation and allowed them to operate in a much uh, further distances and with many, uh, uh, actually with less staff because they had a lack of staff like most of the hospitals uh, during COVID, but it really changed their way of working. And it came with, and it came with uh, quite a lot of challenges in managing operational and also spatial complexity. They had to learn how to work in this uh, new way where you have a lot of screens and you have to understand what is happening and where and how to manage this kind of uh, collaboration remotely. Following what they learned during COVID in the uh, inpatient telemedicine, they decided to open a virtual hospital called Chiba Beyond um, with different programs for uh, hospitalization of patients at home. And their model is really a hybrid model. So they manage physical beds alongside virtual beds of patients at home. And the whole idea is the continuity of care. So if a patient deteriorates at home, they can come back straight to the same unit with the same staff that took care of them at home and, and not going through the ER and the whole uh, uh, diagnostics again. And when we looked closely at those new hybrid models that were developed, we realized that it's not only related to the location of care, where, whether it's at the hospital or at the home, but also at the mode of delivery, if it's physical care or virtual care. So it's multiple. So just to explain, uh, uh, you can see we can have uh, inpatient hospitalization, the kind of the common uh, uh, method of treating patients physically at the hospital, or we can have inpatient telemedicine, like I showed before in the COVID units, taking care of patients in the hospital, but remotely. We can have home hospitalization where the, where the physician comes to treat uh, uh, the patient at home, in a way going back to the uh, 19th century where the doctor came to have a home visit. Or we can have telehome hospitalization really communicating remotely with the patient at home. Now, if we look at the patient journey through diagnostics, hospitalization, uh, uh, consultation, readmission, discharge, rehabilitation, and also the continuity of care, we realize that part of it will be physical and some can be virtual. And it will be uh, um, tailored according to the specific needs of the patient. But it's actually even more complex because some of that can be in the hospital or at the home, whether it's physical or virtual. And here we get to a higher level of complexity, which really needs a system approach on how to manage it and how to control the operation. But again, it holds a lot of potential to uh, provide personalized and really uh, a precise care for each patient needs. So following this approach, uh, this is taken from a conceptual proposal for the Wolfson Economic Prize uh, that I submitted with uh, fellows from the Netherlands, uh, Norway, and Germany. And we really try to show how we should actually design a system 
where the patient himself can be using digital technologies to navigate between physical and virtual environments, whether uh, um, it's the patient choice or the family choice, or maybe the uh, medical team uh, recommendation to really find the best place for the specific needs and, and the patient's needs are dynamic and they're changing. So really what do we need at a certain time? And this can also be developed as a system-centered design, really optimizing uh, resources, creating a much more flexible and resilient uh, uh, system to operate. And, and this was a kind of a conceptual proposal uh, for the um, 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 attempt of the UK to build 40 new hospitals by 2030. And we argued that maybe we don't need to build so many new buildings but actually use the existing environment and really uh, create a more uh, holistic approach of integrating physical and virtual spaces. And again, it's, it can be multiple because we can uh, have care at the home, in the community or at the medical center, whether it's for health promotion and rehabilitation or for, consult for consultation and monitoring diagnostics, or uh, if we need medical and nursing, nurses treatment in each place, so the variety can be much bigger. But again, it's, it's not so easy uh, to actually uh, implement this approach. We really need to think about how we create this healthcare ecosystem if we want to provide the patient to move from the home to the community and to the hospital, whether it's virtual or physical. So just to give a few examples, we need the uh, Ministry of Health or the governments to change regulations, to change their codes so we can provide this kind of services. We have to have hospitals and HMOs in the community to overcome competitions or fears to build collaboration and work together. We need the medtech industry to develop new technologies to uh, provide solutions for unmet needs. We need the insurance firms to change their approach of looking at the patient as a consumer. Um, and obviously we need our industry of healthcare design and architecture to rethink and redesign the built environment to support this change. So to conclude, I will just mention a few points that I think that are uh, important to remember. Uh, I think we are living in a very exciting era um, of digital transformation and planning for change is probably uh, more important than ever. We have to think about design for flexibility on multiple levels. So it's not only the flexibility of the building, but it's ac actually also the flexibility of the organization to adapt and the flexibility of the system, of the whole healthcare uh, uh, system. Resilience was enhanced by digital technologies during COVID, and we have to embrace that and, and build on it for future crises. Uh, inpatient telemedicine that I showed at the COVID units, I truly believe they hold value beyond COVID. This is something that we can really transform how we design medical units if we use virtual um, uh, remote care. There is a potential to develop those hybrid models of virtual and physical care to empower patients and also provide uh, efficiency for the system and obviously um, um, manage the lack of staff that is a big problem all over the world. And we have really an opportunity and I think also a responsibility uh, to transform hospitals as part of the larger healthcare ecosystem. I put on some uh, studies that were part of this presentation, so you can uh, look at them if you're interested for uh, more information. And again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present my work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nareta. Also very interesting uh, research that you've done, and it's tied in. It's interesting hearing the four speakers, how there is commonality but difference in each of them as well. Um, we have now reached, uh, we've got 14, uh, 20 minutes to go till the end of the session, so we're going to uh, go to Q&A, but um, I see we've got two uh, questions from Priya in the, in the 
in the Q&A session, and I'll come to those in a moment. And thank you for your presentations and for all turning on your, your cameras at the moment. But I've also asked our, our leader, as it were, Ray Pentecost, Dr. Ray Pentecost, who's who's online at the moment. You'll see he's on mute. He tells me he's got builders who arrived at his uh, location and it may be a bit noisy. So Ray, we don't want to hear the hammering, uh, but he'll come on as and when he can. And I've asked him to come on board in particular because our first speaker was unable to attend in person. And I thought he, Ray might once want to add something on the basis of having been involved and had having driven, in fact, and initiated this whole a series of talks. So, Ray, thank you for being with us. Um, just some points, uh, just to run through quickly, if I may. Um, the first uh, speaker spoke about uh, modular design, and that was obviously based on uh, on a necessity, the COVID um, pandemic that came along, and I think SARS was also mentioned. So there's an urgency to provide things, and it was quite amazing to see that something can be built in, in a week and put together, and that's very modular. Uh, and uh, everything is, is uh, as we do with medical design, hospital design, um, a lot of it is re uh, revolves around spatial design and allowances uh, but beside beds and, and so on and so forth in between beds. Um, and I think that links a bit onto Cliff's uh, conversation about the 80-20 the because much of it, as he said, uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The 80 is already there. And the exciting part that that um, uh, the researchers are showing us is that that's where the 20% is, is, is coming in. And that's where we need to really drive forward because we all know the 80 and, um, and, and that leads on. I want you to ask a question about materials and also being, uh, Hannah, this I think would link on, on to you. Um, the, the materials that you're doing research on and, and all of us that work in hospital design will know that there's a restriction in certain materials that you can can use uh, in terms of infection control. And I was wondering whether that forms a big part of your research in terms of, because the images you were showing us earlier were um, structural designs, uh, transforming uh, materials and reuse and mixing of some materials. And I was wondering whether uh, the question really being is, uh, do the materials tie in with uh, health design? Uh, you can't use, in, in my country anyway, any uh, t timbers. Um, uh, I'm just wondering whether you can respond to that. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the important question. We uh, have to align uh, to the norms. So if there is a need to develop the materials that we're developing to specific norms leading to uh, uh, certain issues for hospitals, for instance, we need to align to that. So uh, we uh, basically apply different kind of coating systems or whatever kind of necessities for the surfaces uh, that has a direct link to the human body or to uh, towards um, the the uh, health issues regarding breath or smells or whatever, just the same way as other kind of conventional materials. So we always have to um, rely on the norms and standards, and we test the materials according to those. So. Depending on the application, we develop further. Thanks very much. The, the rest of you can add in as, as you wish. I don't feel that necessarily there's only one question for one person. So feel free to jump in as we go along. Um, I'll go on to uh, just put your hand up if you want to add. There's three questions now. And Priya, if I'll go to your question, then I see Cliff's hand up. If Cliff, come to you first. Well, I just want to, I just want to comment on that too because I think one of the important things is that uh, again I would just stress doing the research early in the process allows you to investigate the materials uh, and agree that it has to be the norm. But this is where I think there's a lot of um, impact in terms of both paint, um, uh, copper, uh, antibacterial um, uh, work that's being done. Uh, that you can incorporate. I think the one question is that these are major investments. So that, that means there are major risks to the governments developing them, and they don't like to take a lot of risks um, on new materials. I, I That's why I said that the research that is being done at the universities is so important to move us forward and incorporate that into um, the work that we do. So I just want to stress is that it's, it's so important to continue on the research, and I, I really like the idea that you know, working within the norms, the 80%, but to keep pushing, because one of the things is that uh, this is a big lesson learned, that when we talk about reducing greenhouse gases, the building is around 
but the organization and the amount of materials that we use in a hospital is 80% of the load. And we often don't focus on that. We focus on trying to reduce our cost of the building and trying to ensure it's material. And then we organize our operations inside it. And we're just, we're just as damaging in terms of the use of materials, uh, packaging, single use plastics. So I just want to focus there is just send a message that that's also a part that we need to focus on as designers as well. Just a slight addition to, to say something also positive that we here are not talking about things that are way, way back in the research, that we are way beyond it and the market has already opened and there are um, developments that we done already are now on the market. So we have developed way beyond just being on a research level. This is just for information. Thank you both. Um, Nerit, I just want to go back to a comment before I go to Priya's question. Um, you said uh, we're moving from the design of factories onto design for health. And, and much of this conversation has been about design for health. But would you class uh, the, that the modularized building for necessity, the seven-day design, or not the seven-day design, the seven-day construction as a, a factory because of need at that time? And uh, would that therefore not fall into the design or healthy design or design for health, healing environments, in other words? Yes, I, I think it's an important question. I, I will I will take a bit of a critical stand here uh, because I, I think we actually, uh, as an industry, uh, compromised a lot of the... Um, essence of evidence-based design and healing environments uh, early in the pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of the solutions that were developed uh, very quickly to, to provide solutions. Uh, also in Israel, I don't know uh, if, if I didn't mention that in my presentation, but in Israel, all the hospitals open an emergency hospitals in an underground parking uh, floors because in Israel, we always have emergency uh, uh, hospitals for times of war, and they have to be under, underground. And we really compromised you know, the, the um, quality of the space, of the environment, having no natural light, having no ventilation, natural ventilation. Um, and I think this, this was really something that we have to reflect on. And uh, we, we have to maintain you know, the very basic principles. Uh, I, I always thought about what would Florence Nightingale say if she saw these uh, uh, solutions that we built uh, for COVID. And, and I think that we really have to, to do better um, in providing and maintaining uh, uh, quality of, of, again, of healing environment and well being of not, not only of the patients, but mostly of the staff. They really struggled working with all the protective gear and uh, the long shifts. And um, this is something that we have to, to think about better. Just unmute myself. Thanks, thanks, Narit. Um, I think we may well have answered the first question from Priya, which states uh, the pandemic has called for changes in the design of hospitals, but what about the design for wellness? And I think we've covered that in all the presentations. Priya, if we haven't, just send us another message and we'll but try and elaborate a bit further. But on to your second question, Narit, this is aimed at you. Uh, the replacement of in-person consultation with uh, telemedicine is less effective in India as the doctors have to deal with people who are underprivileged. Any suggestions for designers in such a scenario? Yes, I, I think the development of digital technologies and remote care uh, really brings to light a lot of uh, inequalities in society. Uh, and a lot of, uh, also I would say, ethical questions on who decides when it should be a physical um, um, care or virtual care, and what about population that cannot, that don't have the access to digital technologies or even elderly people who struggle with managing it. Uh, I think that this is, again, something that we have to, um, to take into account as designers. I see uh, too often that the, um, the uh, uh, approach is developed by uh, medical technologies, 
the startups, you know, Israel is known as the startup nations. There are a lot, a lot of companies that are developing devices. And the design of the of the of the uh, system or the architecture of the environment that has to support this is really lacking behind. So I think again we have a challenge here to find uh, ways to overcome this um, challenges of inequality and and really um, um, lack of of technologies for a different population. And there are quite a lot of very interesting projects in Israel, um, even for Orthodox people, how to overcome this. And and I think solutions are are. Um, we can develop solutions, but we really have to integrate a kind of design thinking approach, like Cliff mentioned, uh, with the design of the technologies themselves. Thanks, Nareh. Just going, uh, Cliff? Yeah, can I just add to that? Because I think one, uh, I often think it's true. It's uh, bringing technology, um, having that interaction with a disadvantaged population does impact it. But I also think we can there's a very good case study about uh eye, eye health um where uh, the fact the technology went to uh the, into the community and they were able to with an iphone to actually assess um the individual's uh, eye condition uh give them a test there so they didn't need to go to the hospital and if they did need to go to the hospital they arranged that um to be able to take uh the uh, bus load of people in and have the surgery at a very reduced cost to the entire system and it's a classic example where technology was brought into the community instead of just relying on them having the, the technology. So I think that partnership is absolutely key. And it's a great case study to, to look at efficiencies and how we use technology. And I apologize, I can't remember the, the actual uh, case study or and the organization that does it, but I'm sure if you Google um, uh, eye surgery or eye care in India, you'll find that. Thank you both. I wanted to go back to Hannah's earlier point about um, uh, designing uh, from materials and working outwards, as it were, because most often this ties back to what I said in the beginning is that when you draw on computer ordinarily as an architect, you would come up with a space or a form and you design from the form rather than necessarily, and this is not 100% true what I'm saying, but uh, you, you, you're designing for space, as it were, rather than designing for the materials. And the question that was asked a moment ago, and it was related to India, and it could well relate to the, the continent that I'm, I'm on in Africa at the moment, where, where often the building materials are, are, are limited and uh, the choice of materials are limited uh, for many reasons, either availability um, or uh, price, obviously. Um, and so I think working from the material outwards, and it's interesting seeing, Hannah, your presentation, that it, it deals a lot with uh, structural form in that. And, and again, looking at the buildings that we've seen from everyone thus far, the buildings are, are pretty uh, much like we know buildings. They, they're vertical and they have a number of floors in them. But I was wondering whether... Uh, whether one starts and you said you don't really necessarily need to be talking about furniture, but maybe starting with furniture or the uh, the, the housing of the patients. And, and we heard Nerit saying patients can be both virtual or on site, but maybe looking at furniture and working outwards um, and the comfort of the of the patient could be part of the research as well. So I just throw that in as a as a thought, working your working from the inside out, as it were. Um, Ray, I'm going to, unless anyone wants to respond. Anna? Yeah, yes, I can. I, I think that I would divide your long question into maybe three questions mm -hmm. in one. So one of the questions that uh, I'm not sure if you uh, got me right or if I got you right, that we do not uh, start by a form. We start by the the available material and we see its maximum that we can get to. And then we start on our process. What happens in, in Africa or in other regions, it's, well, very rich regions, by the way, and there is a lot of materials. The point is how we look at the materials. Uh, the point is that we see the uh, non-availability of timber or concrete or steel that we do not have materials, which is false, and we are trying here to highlight what are the benefits of looking at other materials? So if you're looking at Africa and even old cultures, we will see that we are trying here to rediscover what our ancestors were trying to do and rediscover uh, the, the uh, developments that were done in the past, but using the digital technologies we're having the privilege to have at the moment. So that, that is what we're trying to do. Um, 
you were uh, we were talking about uh, um, um, furniture, but only because it's a it's also a, something amusing for students to have a look at something small that they can sit on and test in real time. And the the opportunity here is to look at new kind of structure system that appears like a slab with uh, four columns, which is simply a chair that it is very much abstracted, having a small scale, they can sit on it and test it in, in real time. So it's just a small exercise to um, have a kind of testing for new kind of structure systems. That's the, the overall idea. And the final thing, how this is linked to the normal slab and column uh, thing we can see for the bridges. That's a very good uh, example of showing how those kind of alternative resources could be like having a slab which is equivalent to the slab of the bridge, and that could fit could fit very well in the very well known uh, multi-story buildings. So I hope that this is a, an answer for your question. For your question. No, thank you. I was just <laughs> I, was, I was being supportive of what you were saying. You had a different approach, working from the inside out, rather. So I, I think that was a wonderful uh, way of doing things. Um, well, see, we've got another question that's come up here, and there was a, a thank you from Tam. Uh, and asking if the documents are available for future reference, and yes, they are on the will be on the URA website. And Priya has come back again to ask, um, or say rather, the doctors often find difficulty communicating with people from remote areas, as well, even if they get access to digital digital technology. Now, we've mentioned cell phones, and I know we are come from the. I don't think a single person doesn't have a cell or mobile phone. However, the government is trying to make online knowledge affordable by reducing costs of internet access. Thank you very much. Um, Cl Ray, I'm going to, uh, Cliff, I see you unmuted. I don't know if that means you want to say something or or not. Or No, I just actually, I just, I just put, I couldn't put it into the, the question and answer for everybody in, in our chat. I, the, the location in Italy is Aravind, A-A-R-A-V-I-N-D. That's the organization I was speaking about. Right, thank you. Uh, Ray, I don't know how the builders are performing next to you there, but are you able to come online? <laughs> yeah, I'm here, Kevin. Thanks. Um, and I'll just apologize before it happens. If you hear some loud thumping and banging, um, I'm hoping it's a construction worker and not a child who's upset with a pet. Um, I can tell you that it has been a wonderful, wonderful year and a half. We've had so much fun. A uh, year and a half ago, almost, the UIA approved the Year of Design for Health motion uh, that was developed with Tom Vonier's guidance. And uh, we're, we're just so pleased that 2022 has been the Year of Design for Health. Uh, we had a number of projects. International team was assembled immediately to pull these together including a number of participants today, and I just want to call them out, Karen and Moberdor, uh, Fanny Bavili, Cliff Harvey, Warren Kerr, Kevin Bingham, Norwina, Nawawi. Uh, we also had Pei Ying involved with Tom Veneer uh, and Zipeng Lu, who has worked alongside me at Texas A&M University. Among the international projects that came uh, online very quickly, was a series of webinars to be done during the year of Design for Health. And Norwina and Fanny took the lead on those. They developed all four of the webinars that have uh, come to pass during this year, this latest one uh, now coming to an end. And I'm so grateful for their hard work. It's a tremendous effort to pull all of that together and get the speakers and uh, arrange all of those commitments. It has been a wonderful series, Norwina, and uh, I know Fanny is involved with another meeting, but it has been great, tremendous commitment, tremendous effort. So successful, in fact, that the team is preparing another set of webinars for next year. They are already calendared for February and April and announcements for those will be coming out shortly. We hope you'll all participate in those. Look for announcements to come out through the UIA website and through other means. That's my update, a giant thank you to the team that has worked so hard over the last almost 18 months uh, to pull all of this together. And Kevin, I'll leave it to you to take us away. Thanks very much, Ray. We never heard a hammer or, or an animal screeching, so thank you. 
Um, I've actually got my son's cat irritating me on the side here, so it was about to come from me. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you've said all the thank yous that need to be said. A lot of work has gone into this, and, and Ray uh, leaves it for me to thank you for coming up with this initiative. Um, I, I remember it starting out, and I remember it going through the UI, UI Council, and it was accepted unanimously. So that was a massive step forward. Uh, and and it's, it's all due to you and this team that you've already mentioned. So uh, I, I'm not going to thank everyone again because that had been on my list of things to do. But just to thank the speakers today, each and every one of you have have uh, given us a different aspect, uh, different thought processes, and and you can see uh, from from the questions, and I'm sure we'll get more after this that that there'll be a greater interest in this. And next year is going to be even bigger, Ray. So uh, you're gonna to have to build your team even bigger. But thank you all, Nurit. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Cliff. And uh, thank you to the professor for his first presentation. Uh, and uh, may the year end be uh, blessed for you all with your families and stay safe in this new wave of all the illnesses that come through to us every now and then. So God bless you Thanks all. Thank you. Take care. Bye.